Welcome back. Um, we'll now have our plenary talk for, for this session. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Mason Porter um, from UCLA. Um, Mason uh, did his PhD at Cornell University um, a while ago. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, he's held um, uh, positions at uh, Oxford uh, for a little while, uh, for a few years. And then he went back to his hometown, California. Um, and above all things, he loves the LA Dodgers. That's, uh, and plushies, he loves plushies as well, as you can tell from his picture. So thank you, Mason, for, for giving us this talk. Um, Mason is an expert on, on, um, on networks and he's on um, many contributions on, on the topic and he's one of my friends and, and, and collaborators. Um, so Mason, uh, thank you. And I think you can share your screen now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I appreciate the invitation. Well, you don't need to see my email. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Um, it's always very nice to, that people wanna hear what I have to say. And let me just go ahead and get started. Um, you know, I would love to do this in person and hopefully the next, the next time this conference rolls around, we will be able to do things properly. Um, I wanna talk about opinion dynamics on social networks. Um, and so there's gonna be a, a lot of more social type modeling, which there's you know, a lot of room for applied mathematicians to contribute to this. And so hopefully I will help get you interested in the topic if you're not already. Um, and you know, I'll just I'll introduce you to a few different types of models. Um, you know, we, we don't have things like Newton's laws that we can use. And even we don't even have a lot of the things that one uses in biology. There's, you know, there's a lot less experimental evidence that you can trust. And, and so when you, when you model, you do things based on you know, some sociological theories and you, you, you kind of make toy versions of them mathematically, but there's a lot more uncertainty. Um, and so this really sort of illustrates that a lot more work is, is also needed. Okay, so let me just, you know, let, let you know some stuff I've been thinking about. So, you know, spreading of fake news on social media and misinformation, disinformation, right? We've now, we've now seen that. Um, this, by the way, is a sable and therefore not a new. Um, okay, enough of that. Um, so I want to tell you about a couple types of models. I mean, I'm going to give you more of an introduction. I kind of verbally gave some aspects of it, but I'll show you a little bit. Um, and then the three types of models that I want to, to give you an introduction to, one goes by the name of threshold models. And I'll, I'll give introductions by way of just showing specific work that I've been involved in. But really the major point is the sort of type of model that's more important for the context of this talk than any specific thing that I've done. Um, I'm gonna talk also about adaptive voter models. Voter models, some of you have probably seen because they've been studied in some sense for a while. Um, and I'm gonna also talk about what's called bounded confidence models, which is something I've been spending a lot of time, especially in the last couple of years with some more plans going forward. Um, because I think that those can be connected a little bit more in principle to empirical data. So that's one reason why I'm spending a bunch of time concentrating on them now. And then very briefly, partly because it's something that's impacted all of us and partly because it's another area that really um, can use a lot more work is interactions between say behavior and opinion type models and disease dynamics. Um, so I'm gonna show you one very brief example on one slide of something that my collaborators and I have done recently, again, more as, as a taster and to hopefully encourage some of you to spend some time on it. And then I'll give some conclusions. Okay, so introduction. All right, so, so a social network, I mean, I'm emphasizing the sort of social in terms of what the nodes of the network represent and what the edges represent, but you can be more abstract and just say networks if you want. Um, either graphs or more complicated types of structures. Um, so in nodes, I'm normally thinking of them as representing individuals. And an edge is some kind of some social connection or perhaps a communication channel between them. So it might be something that is offline, right? Like people are really close to each other. And, you know, it still kind of happens sometimes, but it used to happen more often. Or, or phone calls 
or a Facebook friendship or Twitter followership. And, and, and this could represent actual like connections, but it could also be used to represent, say, act interactions, right? So, so there are different choices in what one might use. And then different things can propagate on different types of networks. So offline diseases can propagate and then online information or memes or, or whatever. And when you're thinking about the structure of these networks, the, the models that are used will have a complicated mixture of regular and random structures. So I'm putting random in quotes because we might model it with, with a sort of a way to generate random graphs, but that's kind of a model of uncertainty from an empirical network, right? It might not literally be random, but the model we use might be random. And then you ha have many instantiations of it. And, and a good random graph model, and, and people have been using this a lot in, in, in studies of epidemics, for instance, but a good random graph model can then provide a baseline for comparison. And when you're studying what some process does on the model, you take advantage of the fact that we know something about the structure. Um, and so that helps us understand the dynamics because we, we want to use that knowledge to our advantage. Okay, I have a booklet. You can find a copy from Springer. You can also just find it from my website. Uh, it's short, which I think is, is, is um, a good thing. And it's basically just a primer for dynamical systems on networks. You know, what types of things do we think about? It's mostly coming from a, an abstract point of view. So it's not really getting very heavy with real data and so on. But one of the basic types of questions would be given some kind of structure, how does that affect the dynamics? If the structure is of a certain type, maybe that will affect the dynamics in some way, make diseases easier to spread, for instance, or make diseases harder to spread. If the structure is some other type, maybe it will do something else. Okay, so that, and that's not the only question people ask, but that's a big one. And you can also ask the question in reverse, how might the dynamics affect the structure? So for instance, if somebody, you know, has COVID, they're supposed to stay home and therefore they have different social contacts. And so therefore the dynamics, what state you're in affects the structure. And so these things couple together and you can make this arbitrarily complicated. Okay, I'm not gonna go through this entire slide, but there is a general point that I wanna make because people often do this implicitly and it's not usually spelled out in papers, but when you write down a certain model, you've almost always made some kind of assumption about this. And this has to do with the timescales at which network structure changes relative to the timescales at which say the states of the nodes or in general, the dynamics change. And so if I am assuming that the structure is constant and running a model on it, like a disease model, I have made an assumption on the timescales. And the most common assumption in that case, though it's not the only possible one, would be that the states of the nodes are changing much faster than the network structure right? Because I'm not tracking the network structure. There's actually other possible timescales as well, but that's the sort of most straightforward. Um, I have a discussion of this in this booklet, and I also, you know, a little bit of this stuff on this slide is mentioned. And it could be that the structure changes much faster than the states. So maybe I'm going to ignore the states, and I'm just going to look at how the structure changes, and then I get a temporal network. And the most generic situation is when the timescales are comparable, and then I can't ignore either of them. So we get adaptive networks or co-evolving networks. And so there's a coupling between them, right? So this is the most generic one, but it's also the hardest because we're keeping track of more things. Um, most of the stuff in this talk will live in this first bullet point, but I will very briefly talk about some adaptation um, just to give you an idea of how one might include that in, in a model. Um, most ways of including the model in practice are very idealized because that's what we know how to do, not because that's what we think is correct, right? I mean, we know this in, in applied mathematics, right? We're often making assumptions to, to be able to just do something. And then the hope is that that's still reasonable, but really we'd like to do more. It's just, it's hard. Okay, so one type of model that can occur and the type that I wanna focus on today Spreading and opinion models, those are often treated differently. I'm kind of combining them together just for convenience for, for exposition. Um, but, you know, stuff other than opinions can, spread, can spread, of course. Um, there are lots of types of models. I'm actually going to show four different types, but there's three that I really want to introduce you to. And the fourth I'm only going to do very briefly at the end. And one is known as a threshold model. These are like these cascade models. Cascades are a common feature that you see in there. 
Um, and these have discrete states traditionally, and almost all studies only have two states. So think of them as uninfected and infective or inactive and, and active or off and on or whatnot. And what they do is that they model social reinforcement in some kind of contagious spreading process. So these are so-called complex contagions or sometimes called social contagions. Um, another one I wanna bring up are voter models. These are not really a model for voters, but the name is just kind of stuck with us at this point. These are also discrete valued opinions, but they can kind of change back and forth. So, it, so you don't necessarily have a cascading type of behavior. Um, and you're really thinking of interactions between say two nodes at once, or um, sometimes you have hypergraphs so multiple nodes at once, but you're really thinking of a localized interaction rather than the environment your node is in, whereas in a threshold model, you're kind of thinking of what's the opinion of those that are surrounding you. And then something called bounded confidence models, and I'll need to explain a little bit more about these later, these have continuous valued opinions. And so that's a distinction between, between that family of models and, and, and various others that people have spent time on. Okay, so let me start by introducing you to threshold models. And again, the, the main point of my talk is just to give these three different flavors of stuff. The stuff that I specifically have spent time on is more for concreteness and is less important than the style of model itself in terms of what I want you to take away from the talk. Okay, so the most, the most famous threshold model is known as the Watts threshold model which is named after Watts, but actually in some form predates him by a few decades. Everything's named after somebody who did not invent it. Um, and in, in the most traditional type of this model, so in this particular one, so each node in a network, so I've got some networks, so say the network is just a graph, um, and say for simplicity that, there's, that it's undirected and that there's no weights on the edges. So each node has some threshold that's drawn from some distribution. So this is picked before, any dynamic start um, could come from empirical data, although there's trickiness with it. Uh, uniform and Gaussian are two very common choices for these for the distributions from which to draw these thresholds. And each node starts in one of two states. So zero, which is inactive and so on, or one, which is active or infected or whatever. And we choose some fraction of, of nodes. So we need an initial condition to be initially in state one and everyone else is in state zero. And there's other ways of doing this too, but that's you know for the sake of argument. And then a technical point, a lot of the papers don't actually mention this explicitly, but it's, but it's actually an important technical point. You can, in, in all these models, you can think of either having synchronous updates where you have a map and you update every node at, one, at once. So I go from time n minus one to time n and I'm updating all the nodes in principle. Or you could think of asynchronous updating which is a discretization of continuous time, and you're really only updating, say, one node at once. Or in the case of bounded confidence models, will end up being two. But you know, just think of it's a discretization of continuous time, and this can be done using Gillespie um, type algorithms so that you're not biasing which nodes you choose to update. Um, for the specific model, the watch threshold model, these two will give you the same thing as t goes to infinity but not for finite time, right? So, but, but you know, same steady states. For generic models, it will not have the same steady states. The reason it has the same steady states for this specific models is that the updates are, are deterministic. Okay, and then, so we need an update rule. And the specific update rule in the watch threshold model is that I look at my R sub J, which you can think of as, as a sort of inertia or stubbornness or, or something. And you compare that to a peer pressure which might be the fraction of your neighbors who are infected. So K sub J is my degree, that's how many neighbors I have, and M is how many are infected. And if at least a certain fraction are infected, then I will become infected if it's my turn to update. And so the peer pressure, which is this M over J function, is at least as large as, as my sort of latency or inertia. Um, and these sorts of models have a monotonicity property, or this one does, and most of the models like this that are studied do, that's very unrealistic. And then if I go from state zero to one, I stay at one forever. And this is a property that is convenient for certain types of mathematical um, methods that people use, in particular using um, kind of branching process like analyses for these. Okay, so this assumption is there 
for mathematical convenience. And you can think about what types of phenomena in real life might this might not be completely crazy to do. Um, and the, the standard way in, each, in which these models get generalized, and so by showing you one of my papers, um, hopefully I'll help illustrate that, is either you make this peer pressure M over KJ term more complicated, or you make this R sub J more complicated, right? So you take this inequality and you either make the left-hand side or the right-hand side more complicated, and different ways of making it more complicated tends to be how different types of these models get generalized. Um, for people who are more from probability, this style of model is related to bootstrap percolation, and it's also related to what are called kinetically constrained models. So if you want to go into the more mathematical literature, there's a different family of generalizations there rather than in the social dynamics literature. And if you want a good place to start as an introduction to um, sort of these types of models, James Gleason wrote a nice physical review X paper that actually has a table of a number of these, of these models that are related to each other. So various percolation models and so on. Okay. Um, so one thing that can happen is that you can get different steady state levels of adoption depending on the initial condition. And so in this particular example, um, so I have a very small network here. I suppose that every node has the same threshold. So 30% of its neighbors need to be active for it to activate. Um, and so if I start with only the initial node activated, eventually everyone will be activated. If I start with only this node activated, eventually um, five of the nodes are activated. And if I only start with this node activated, eventually two of them. And the branching process type theories that are used to analyze these models, they, will, they're actually, they actually give you time dependent rows, this fraction of active nodes. They'll give you time dependent rows, but they are ensemble averages over the initial conditions. So the methodology is not good at doing specific initial conditions and how they're different at each other, different from each other, but they are good at doing a time dependent version. And so one of the mathematical ways that's worth generalizing is to get stuff that really can resolve what happens with different initial conditions, because they can be rather different from each other. Okay, so here's one of the things I did. And yes, we use the word hipsters in the, in the, in the, in the title. And you know the hipster was on the network before it was cool to be on the network, of course. This is joint work with Jonas Ewell, who was a visiting master's student when we first started working on this. The, the paper came out a few years after he visited, and he's now a postdoc at Cornell working with Steve Strogatz and others. Um, so we use the same rules that I mentioned before to adopt some product. So if you're going to go from zero to something, it's the same rule as before. So you have this peer pressure of, 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 of M over, over, over my, my number of friends. But there's two products, okay? So this is how we're generalizing. There's two products. There's A and B. Uh, neither one is inherently better than the other. And most nodes are conformists. And what they're going to do is they're going to look in the majority of their local neighborhood. This is with synchronous updating, by the way. Uh, and so discrete time steps. Um, so we're going to look at we're going to look at my local neighborhood, and we're going to adopt. If if I choose to adopt at all, I'm just going to adopt whichever one is in the majority of my local neighborhood. And then there's hipster nodes, and what they're going to do is that they're going to look at a bestseller list. So we're not going to look at the local neighborhood. We're going to look at the bestseller list, but with a time delay, tau time steps ago. So if tau is one, then it would be doing it looking at the same time as a conformist node. And so I'm going to look at the bestseller list, and I'm going to pick whichever one is less popular. That's what a hipster does. You can tell with the glasses and the beard. OK, so what can happen? This is a complicated slide. I understand that. I just want to give a little intuition. So as an example network, and again, we're, we're choosing random graphs that are convenient. We're taking a five regular configuration model for this, for this plot. And there's a few others we consider in the paper. Five regular means that every node has five friends. Configuration model means that subject to all nodes being of that type, we connect each edge to each nodes to each other uh, uniformly at random. So, so each stub, each edge is connected uniformly at random to another edge. Okay, so it's a random matching, but all nodes have the same type. And the different plots here, and I know it's a little hard to read. This is tau equals one, time delay of one, time delay of two, time delay of three. And we start with more nodes of type A. Um, very slight, very slight advantage to type A, not so much. Type A is in red, type B is in blue. 
And we're plotting the probability of hipsters, which is an empirical probability. So that it's going to end up being the fraction of nodes that are hipsters on the horizontal axis. And we're plotting rho infinity, this, this steady state adoption for both A and B on the vertical axis. And so for instance, with this tau equals three that I'm showing here, you've got this range where the less popular product wins. And you've got this other range where the less popular product wins. Okay, so there's these large swaths um, where the less popular product wins. This happens also for tau equals five, for instance. And okay, so why does this happen? So here's an intuitive reason. Let's consider a simpler network. So this is this is a three regular tree. So um, so we have that we have the center node, and let's suppose that our hipster accidentally shows up right near that node. Okay. So this hipster causes an entire branch of this tree, even though there's only one hipster, causes an entire branch of this tree to adopt the less popular product, even though there's only one hipster. And so that's already one third of the nodes. So if a hipster shows up in a spot that gives a roadblock, and I know five config regular configuration models have a rather different structure, so it's gonna be a more complicated situation. But if it gives a roadblock, a very small fraction of hipsters can lead to a very large number of, of the minority um, opinion being, you know, the initially minority uh, nodes getting getting adopted or opinion getting adopted. Okay, so this is an idealized situation, but the the point is you can have this rather generically. Now, is this the mechanism by which it occurs in real life? Well, okay, probably not. It's it's kind of simpler than that, or I'm sorry, this is simpler than reality. But the idea is that you don't have to work hard to construct a model in which this is generically true. And so the message is that, you know, people often get surprised when some sort of anti-establishment thing, win, thing wins. And I think that our intuition is wrong. It's a lot easier for that to happen than what our intuition suggests. So that's what I think is the real world mechanism or the real world into, um, implication, even though we're, we're looking at a very idealized situation mathematically. Okay, so I told you it was gonna be quick. The paper's 20 pages. You can look at all the details if you want it. That's what papers are for. Okay, adaptive voter models. All right, well, first of all, there is the voter model. The, because there's actually more than one variant and the different variations can be important. A good place to start, um, especially in terms of the different ways people have been, have generalized these things, is there's a recent paper by Sid Redner. I had never heard of this journal before I saw this paper in it, but this is a nice, and reality inspired is really a nice phrasing too, right? It's not that they're realistic, it's just that you put in specific features that are inspired from some realistic observation that you wanna put into the model. Okay, so the voter model is traditional one, people have two opinions, say, you know, zero and one, A and B, let's say A and B, and an individual will update their opinion based on the opinion of one neighbor. So instead of kind of surveying the neighborhood as in a threshold model, you're talking about an interaction, say, between a node and one neighbor. So again, you can do synchronous versus asynchronous updating. Um, so for example, you could select a random node and then a random neighbor. So that's a node-based one, but you could also select a random edge and then take the two nodes at that edge. And selecting a random node gives you different dynamics from selecting a random edge. So for instance, the convergence rates are different. So that's why, that's that's the big reason why I put the, the the in quotes. Selecting a random node to start out with and selecting a random edge are actually different in a very fundamental way mathematically. Um, you could also perhaps select a random discordant edge where you have A on one and B on the other. Okay, so one of the things that various people have done is to generalize this to adaptive models where the structure of the network is coupling with the, with the opinions of the nodes. And, and voter models are, are one of the types of models where there's been the most work on adaptive models because people have found um, mathematically tractable ways of doing it. So the first one of these that I'm aware of is by Petter Holman and Mark Newman from 2006. And then there's a thread of more mathematical work that started from Rick Durrett and company in PNAS in, I forgot what year that paper came out, but, um, there's a number of people on that, and there's actually been even some rigorous pure math work on it. So probabilist Alan Sly, 
who won a MacArthur Award, part of the citation of that was for his rigorous work on adaptive voter models, right? So, so this has been a nice example in which applied um, ideas have actually then contributed towards more theoretical mathematics because it introduced problems, some of which have even been able to be done fully rigorously. Most of the work has been more heuristic. Okay, so we have one particular way that we generalize this recently. This is my former PhD student, Jakub Kure, who is now um, and he's now doing quantitative finance and industry and you know making money as it were. Um, we have asynchronous updates and we did edge based. So we're choosing edges uniformly at random. Okay, so here is how ours work. And we actually consider three different types of rewiring. We consider a rewire to random, which means we uniformly at random, if I'm picking this edge to rewire, I could pick any of the edges to, to go to. So suppose I have A as my pivot node and I rewire this edge, I could pick the same node, the same one before, so I can remove it and bring it back. We do allow that, it's just easier for, for the formulation of the model. Or I could do this node, or I could do that node. And I don't care what the state of it is. I just basically look at everything that's possible. Okay, so remove this and I pick each of the empty ones with uniform probability, including the one I got rid of. Rewire the same, it's very similar except that I only consider nodes that have the same state as me. And rewire to none is just, I remove it and don't rewire to anything. The rewire to none in terms of the types of mathematics that people use for these models, which is a sort of mean field or um, also approximate master equation types. Um, rewire to none is actually harder for those mathematical techniques because you no longer preserve the total degree, which tends to get used in those mathematical techniques. So rewire to none models unfriending. We were motivated a bit by things like discussions on Facebook in the 2016 election in which unfriending occurred when things got contentious. And so that's so the rewire to none is one that has not been studied as much as, as the others. And the picking nodes randomly when you when you do the rewiring, this is one of the reasons that I call the type of adaptation unrealistic. That's not really what we do. But, you know, it allows us to do some math and you can ask what happens. How does that change convergence rates? What is a steady state and so on? Um, the other thing that in terms of actually having uh, this sort of mechanism, we have a certain probability. So this is this is um, so. So, OK, so the rewire to none was one of the innovations that we did. And the way we did this probability is another one of the innovations we did with our work. Um, so we have a probability of doing a rewiring step sigma to the Q. So there's this parameter Q that's going to that's going to change our probability, right? So if Q is larger, then our probability of doing rewiring is smaller. Um, and then we have a complementary probability of doing a normal voter model type opinion update of whatever flavor one chose. And I mentioned which one we chose. Okay, so some probability of rewiring that gets smaller as Q gets larger and some complementary probability of um, changing opinion through voter model dynamics. Okay, and this is just an illustration of what I just said, um, what I said um, verbally. And then just as a note, terminology that tends to get useful for these types of things. You say an edge is concordant if the opinions are the same of the nodes that are attached to it, and it's discordant if they're different. Right, so 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 that becomes useful language that one that one uses. So uh, a very common thing that people will plot on a vertical axis um, as a function of whatever you're tracking is the number of discordant edges or the fraction of discordant edges that are that are in a network. And you try to see, you know, maybe a steady state occurs when this goes to when the, when, when this number goes to zero, for instance. Right. So so that's a common order parameter if you want to use statistical physics language that people would track. Okay, so one of the things, again, choosing good random graph models. So in this case, we're choosing erdos renyi random graphs, and I have capital N nodes, and pairs of nodes are connected with uniform independent probability P, so I can generate a bunch of those. Um, and so for instance, I could look at the terminal density of the minority state, whichever one it is, as a function of Q. Remember the probability of an opinion update gets smaller as Q gets larger, and you find what may be a phase transition. So if you have a small probability of, a, of an opinion update, you end up getting about a 50-50 because you're just rewiring and you're rewiring discordant edges. And then it drops off off the table and you get something like this. This is above zero. 
the reason that this is strictly above zero is that you you can end up with disconnected components in the network and so if a is your is your majority state you might have a small component that has only b and so so this generically ends up going to above zero okay so that, that's that's actually a feature and then in this plot we show the terminal density of state a each blue is from one run and each black is an ensemble is a sample mean uh, over some number of runs probably it was 100 okay so what really what the blue tells you is that either a wins or b wins okay and the black is giving you the relative fraction of the time that a is winning versus b is winning so the black is is very noisy and really the individual runs plotting a lot of them on top of each other right so this blue is like 100 different runs or something right so if i fix one value of q there's like 100 runs for different values of q so you can see that as we change this parameter, which is telling us how, how often we're rewiring versus how often we are changing our opinion, we get structures and in principle, one can try to study the phase transitions. We don't do the phase transitions rigorously. We just do it numerically. So there's definitely a lot more mathematical things that one can do, but we're seeing intriguing structure. And if you pick different network structures, and I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail, but if you pick different network structures, you get different phase transition type structures. Right, so again, the different structure of the network can affect the dynamics. And I'm not gonna go through what those structures are. Okay, um, let me go through this a little bit, just because echo chambers is something that we think about a lot. And there's something called a majority illusion. That, that's one of the things that we study in this paper. And we invented a new word, minority illusion, that can happen as well. Um, I first saw this terminology in a paper that Christina Lerman and her uh, former students and postdocs wrote. Um, so you can take a look there. And the idea is it's another local versus global type of dichotomy. If I am, say, this red node and I survey my neighbors, you know, it might be that, the, and, I, and I ask, okay, are you red or are you, or are you white? It might be that a larger fraction of my red nodes, my neighbors are also red, even though the majority is white. So think of, um, again, another motivation is, you know, think of the 2016 presidential election um, in the U.S. And, you know, like what I was seeing on my Facebook feed were like lots of people voting for Clinton. But I wasn't seeing it because that was the majority. I was seeing it because that's who my friends were. And the thing is, it's very easy to construct a network with this property, right? In fact, that's very common. The more, the more relevant thing is that, you know, people choose friends often based on homophily birds of a feather flock together. You know, you have friendships based on similarity. So it's not just that you can have networks that, that do it, but because social networks form with homophily as a fundamental idea, you expect to have it in real social networks because those are the types of networks that form, right? So it's not just that networks can have it, it's that those are the ones that we see in real life. So you expect these things to occur. And the dynamics, if you're doing something mathematically, is going to reflect that. You know, so so models should have that, and it's worth exploring those. So we look at a majority illusion, a minority illusion, or co-evolving voter model, and depending on edge probabilities that I have not explained properly to go through this table in any meaningful sense, you can either have a majority illusion, which is what I described. You can have a minority illusion, which means you think you're the minority, but you're actually the majority. Or you could have none or both. Right. And so we explore the sort of space in a certain family of random graph models. The, the, the type of family is known as a stochastic block model. Um, all, all, all the networks in this paper of the different types are actually drawn from stochastic block models with different probabilities. So, so in fact, the difference between this one and this one and the one on, on this slide are all the different probabilities. There, there's three different probabilities that we were choo choosing. Okay, so I know I've not given you enough information for that to be genuinely understandable, but I, but I hope I've given you a flavor of the types of questions that we can ask and the, and the type of model that that is. Okay, third type, bounded confidence models. Um, and this is something, as I mentioned, that I've been spending a lot of time on the last few years, the last couple of years, and I have grandiose plans. So there's a couple other papers coming out in the near future and more coming. How do these work? Okay, so these are a little bit less well studied than threshold models and voter models. So instead of instead of there being 50 years of work, there's more like 20 years of work. 
So there's still a lot of work on specific parts of it. It's just less than the others. So we have continuous valued opinions. There is something in the chat. Ah, okay, just a reminder of questions. We have continuous valued opinions on some space. So for example, between minus one and one, um, it, it can have as many dimensions as you want. The one dimension has been explored the most. And you want this space to have a metric structure. You need a notion of the distance between opinions. Okay, so that's, that's a requirement. And when two agents interact, and this is what the, is known as a bounded confidence mechanism, and this comes from social psychology, um, if their opinions are sufficiently close, they will compromise by some amount, right? So their distance from each other in this underlying space is within a certain boundary. And otherwise, if they're interacting, their opinions don't change. You can, of course, generalize this. You could say, oh, maybe they dig in their heels and their opinions get farther apart, right? So there's different ways of generalizing it. The two best known variants and the different generalizations build typically on one of these two. One of them is known as a Defont et al. model, sometimes called the Defont model, sometimes called the Defont Weisbusch model. So there's a few authors involved in how many get credit. You know, it depends on who's writing the paper. This has asynchronous updating of node states. The Helgsman Krause model has synchronous updating of node states. And here there's randomness in the updates. And so we're not, unlike, the, unlike the threshold model, we are not going to have the steady states being the same. So there's basically, they are different models. And it's hard to justify them based on empirical, empirical knowledge. And so you end up needing to explore which results are common to the two flavors of models. Um, the computation times for these models can get extremely long. And so that's one of the challenges that arise. Um, there's a lot less known mathematically about these models and the other flavors I've told you. Less has been developed on mean field theory. If you take mean field theories, you get sort of kinetic-like models, but with kernels that are harder than what people normally study with those kinetic models. Um, Hexelman krause is not as computationally intensive, although it's still very computationally intensive, but not as much as Stefan at all. And so that's, that's the main reason sometimes people use the synchronous updating because that, that ends up being a shortcut for convenience. Okay, most of the studies have all to all coupling with agents. And so my thread of work the last couple of years has been adding more network structure. Okay, so there's, the, and people tend to have, have focused on when does consensus occur and how often does it occur? But that actually is very different from a lot of the early motivation for introducing these models, which was trying to explore, again, not all of them, but some of them, how extremist ideas, even if you see it in a small poor portion of a population, can take root. Not that that would ever happen in real life. But, but what's been studied in the models has been this mathematically convenient thing, which is really rather different from, from the motivation of introducing it. And so people have kind of gotten fixated on the simplest mathematical problem instead of on, I think, what can be done with the full power of these models. And I think there's therefore a lot of room to explore. And so, so, so this is definitely a family of models that I think can use more attention, even with the lost papers on them, there's a lot more to do. Okay, so we're gonna put these on networks and this thing in the lower right will have a larger screenshot in the next slide. Um, a nice paper to start. I think it's nice. I should not call my own papers nice. That was not, that was not appropriate to me. But my former undergraduate, Flora Mung, who I believe is almost going to get her PhD at MIT now, so she was a student at Oxford, um, and Robert Van Gorder was a postdoc at Oxford at the time and is now at, I think it's called Oswego University in New Zealand. Um, we have a very long introduction to this paper, much longer than usual, to really focus on different things people have done, because there weren't really nice review articles available at the time, so we did more of a review in the introduction than, nor than even normal. And so that could give a decent idea of what people have thought about. And continuing with the theme that I've discussed, network structure has a big effect on dynamics, including how many opinion groups form, how long they take to form. So what we do is each discrete time, so it's asynchronous, but discrete time, we select a pair of agents, so it's a generalization of Defont Weisbusch, to select a pair of agents who are adjacent, and if they're close enough to compromise, and if they're too far apart, they don't change. This is what this equation one is actually saying. It's, it's, it's the mathematical version of what I was saying in English. And yeah, how does consensus occur? Or consensus, or some people use, use the word polarization for two groups, or uh, fragmentation for three plus groups. Although sometimes people will use polarization to just mean two plus. And how does this depend on parameters? And in particular, this compromise parameter M, which says, if I'm changing my opinion, how much do I move? 
and this this confidence bound C, which says, well, what distance do I of difference in opinion do I allow to change my opinion in the first place, right? So how does how do these number of groups at steady state depend on those two parameters and depend on the specific structure of my network, right? That's the type of question people ask, and there actually appears to be a critical transition. I wrote critical transition, so it's not. So we think it's a phase transition, but you know one has to actually like you know prove it mathematically, which we've not done, um, with respect to C on certain types of networks. So that's a bunch of numerical discussions that are that are that are in this particular paper. Okay, I know this is a bit blurry because I'm being naughty and doing screenshotting instead of writing this properly. So let's say how it works. So I have node I and J. I and J have been chosen to interact. So based on their opinion at T, we're going to see what happens at T plus one. So here's my opinion at T. Here is the difference between my opinions. If it is smaller than C, I will compromise by an amount M that is proportional to this difference. Otherwise, I will stay the same. And node J will do analogously compromising by the same amount. And this delta is specifically subscript I and J because it's the opposite sign. Okay, so, so it's correct that, these, that this index is, is drawn the opposite way. So that's how it does. That's how this works. And there's various ways that you could adjust this. So, so certain ways of generalizing the model would be generalizing how this particular step works. And there's other ways too. Even just the influence of the network structure is much less known for, for this family of models than for, for those others that I was telling you about earlier. So an example is these GNP networks. All right, I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but I wanna give you a hint of one thing that people have spent a little bit of time on. So this is one of the plots in the paper. I know so many, so many panels. Confidence bound is a vertical axis. So confidence bound of say 0.1. So not so much compromising here. Confidence bound of one. Well, always compromising. The color is a natural logarithm of the convergence time and capital, capital red. The largest red means division. What that really means is that we spent a bunch of time running this model and there was no convergence before we quit after some bailout time. So it doesn't mean it won't converge later. It just means that it did not converge in the time that we ran it. Okay, so we call it division, but the more precise thing is we gave up. Um, and the multiplier M is um, how much you compromise. And most papers actually only make this between zero and 0.5, but in our particular paper, which is an unusual choice, we allowed it to go all the way to one, which is, which is an overcompensation. I have 10 minutes left. Yes, I do. Um, okay. Uh, so we have a symmetry, a left-right symmetry, which is because of the overcompensation M. So if we take a look at this, G of N 0 0.1, so 0 0.1 probability, you'll notice that there looks like there might be some curve here. It's noisy because we only average over like 10 or 20 different networks. So uh, the computation time was really long, so we only average over a small number of networks. And um, this curve has actually now been heuristically derived by Susan Fennell and James Gleason and some others in a paper that I'm not involved in. It was not mathematically rigorous, but there is a known heuristic theory that there is a curve between these regions. And so they were directly motivated by this particular plot in that paper. And that's actually why I'm showing you this plot versus others, just to say this is like the one thing from our paper that somebody who then has done something mathematically. Um, and so this structure is actually, this one is known. Most of them are still just the level of numerical experiments. So this, this particular paper has the flavor of tons of numerical experiments. Okay, so how do we generalize this? There's different ways of doing it. And one is to examine how, how media might affect things. And this is joint work with my former postdoc, Heather Brooks, who's now faculty at Harvey Mudd. And this appeared uh, last, sorry, last year. It appeared two years ago. Sorry, we're in a time loop. It's now 2022. Anyway, we have discrete events, and this will hopefully illustrate why I think that these sorts of models can be better for comparing with empirical data than some of these other types of models. We have discrete events, which is a sharing of stories, say like retweeting, but the probability to share them and thereby influencing the opinions of neighboring nodes is based on a bounded confidence mechanism. So individuals in the network are interacting with shared stories and they're changing their opinions. But those discrete sharing events can, in principle, be compared to discrete sharing events with, with actual data. And, and so that type of comparison 
even though we don't know the underlying opinions, is one that I think in principle allows more comparison with real data than the other families and models. And then one innovation in this paper is that the distance is based both on a location ideology space, which is what I was showing you before, but also on quality of content. So we incorporate a notion that if content is bad, the opinion better be even closer to you to be willing to share it. And then we do this, and we also have media nodes that only have out edges. So we don't let them be influenced, but they can influence others. So the thing, one thing we observe, so this is the number of media accounts on the vertical axis, this is for some network. Actually, most plots look like this in our particular our particular um, uh, paper. We have the followers per media account. Okay, so how popular they are, and this is this is assuming all media account for this particular simulation have the same number of followers. Um, and this R is measuring what we call entrainment. Um, if you're uncharitable, you might call it brainwashing but it's basically entrainment. And so larger R means that the media nodes have affected the opinions more of, um, uh, of, of the nodes in the network. And so, large, so dark, deeper red means there's been more entrainment. And so you see this band. And the interesting thing about this band is it occurs when there's a moderate number of followers and a moderate number of media accounts. It doesn't occur when there's too many, because what happens when there's too many is that you influence some people too quickly and you don't influence as many others. And so the overall measure is lower. And that's perhaps not intuitive, but this happens very robustly, not in every example, but in, 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 in many diverse examples. Here is a plot I want to show you. Um, so this, this data comes from the media bias chart from Adfontis from a certain version and it's hand curated. So the opinion values are a left to right spectrum and the quality values are zero to one. It's, it's um, again, it's hand curated. So this is, this is, so we're putting now a different simulation where we have this as initial opinions of the media and we, 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 we label each node with an opinion which we determine uniformly at random. And um, the vertical axis, or sorry, the, um, the colors in here are, are, are the same as the horizontal axis is just to help visuals, okay? So, so the, the colors don't mean anything extra in this plot. So this is how we start things. And you, know, you might have like you know, info wars down over here, for instance, and CNN here maybe slightly to the left and reasonable quality um, and so on. And so we go T equals one, two, five. So more time, time goes on. And what happens, right? So we've got you know, reasonably high quality stuff that are very popular in the center. And you've got reasonably low quality stuff that are very popular here, kind of on the right. I'm not saying any names to protect the guilty. And you end up getting two groups, one of which is reasonably high quality sharing of information in the center, and one of which is low quality sharing of information on the right. Now, remember, this was an input in the model. So this is an input, and we have a bounded confidence mechanism, and we get, you know, plausible echo chambers. And I'm not saying that that's how those really form, but, you know, a simple mechanism gives it to you. Okay, another thing you can do, different type of model. Just, I forgot to put another transition. This is a different type of model, recent paper. This just came out. The first author is Kayan Peng, who is a finishing PhD student of mine um, who has a job waiting for her at Facebook. So she's joining the dark side. She's extremely smart as well, despite joining the dark side um, and has this awesome paper that you should look at that came out in December. And we do a multi-layer network model that incorporates opinions and behavior. Um, and the opinion that we were thinking of was either no opinion, pro-physical distancing and anti-physical distancing. Right, so motivated by COVID, but making things very simple. And um, we are thinking of, if you're pro-physical distancing, maybe your probability of getting infected on the other layer. So you have, an, you have one layer of a network in which opinions are spreading and you have another layer in which diseases are spreading and they interact. So we use what's known as a multi-layer network model. Um, which can, is another talk in and of itself. So pro-physical distancing, we're going to assume that I have less of a chance of being infected. We're not actually changing the network structure on the other layer, which would be more realistic. We're just assuming that the infection probability is lower, right? So, so we're encoding this in a very unrealistic way, but just to illustrate a point. And if you're anti-physical distancing, we are taking the um, spreading probability, the infection probability to be larger, even though really, if you want to be more realistic, you would change the network structure. Okay. So people who are anti-physical distancing are more likely to become infected. So you could imagine doing a version of this with like vaccination and masking, but we were working on the paper during the summer in which it was more physical distancing type stuff. 
Okay, so you can look at the paper for details. It's a very mathematically oriented paper. We do a mean field theory. A, a gross simplification that we make is to take compartmental models on each layer. So it is reasonable to make diseases spread via compartmental models. That's the standard way of doing things. It's a stretch to make opinions spread via compartmental models, but we do it for convenience. And the reason it's convenient is that when we do a mean field theory, we have the same types of mathematical structure on the two layers. And so it's an important convenience for what we do. So, it's this, so this really is, a, a, a this, this paper illustrates a point in principle, but is still centered at, in a very mathematical place. But an important thing to do, and there's a Nature um, Human Behavior article, a uh, perspective piece that we cite and that I recommend that you look at, that illustrates different things that one should do and then one can do to couple disease and behavior models. Right, we've seen this over the last two years. It's not enough to just do a compartmental model. You have to incorporate what people actually do because that's changing everything. And so that's a big thing that people need to do. Okay, I went through this way too fast, but I hope I made my point. Conclusions, and I know I have less than one minute left, so I'll go through this slide and then I'll be done. There's lots of cool stuff. There are different types of models. I've illustrated actually four, although three with more detail. Opinion dynamics and disease dynamics interact. How to structure effect dynamics and vice versa. Is there consensus? How many groups do you get? Do you get to a steady state? How long does it take to converge? We have got some recent papers and work in progress. You can think about interactions between more than two people at once. Everything's been pairwise um, in terms of what I've been doing today. So we have a bounded confidence model on hypergraphs which my PhD student, Abby Hickok, um, led, and there's some other names here. We have an adaptive bounded confidence model. And here you need to be clever about what it means for an edge to be discordant. It's not just saying A is different from B because we have continuous opinions. So you have to then decide how you want to define the notion of discordance in the first place. And there might be different ways to choose. This is led by my former undergraduate, Anchita Kanjanasaratul, who's now a, post, or now, now a PhD student in um, computational social science at George Mason. And um, uh, my former PhD student, Michelle Fung, and I um, mentored Anchita. Michelle is now a postdoc at Caltech. And then we're looking at spreading cascades on this. This should come out in a few months. We're looking at continuous versions of it. So instead of this abrupt mechanism that I showed you, relaxing it and making it continuous because then there's other types of math you can do. Um, this is with my current postdoc, Phil Chadro. And then also putting the bounded confidence model on multi-layer networks, that's, that's going to take a little bit longer. But these two that are in preparation should show up um, in a few months. And these other two up here, you can already go and look at. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mason, for this amazing talk. Are there any questions for Mason? I know, it's just like one of my classes. I overwhelm people. <laughs> Oh, it was amazing. Well, there, are, there were a lot of information, I think. <laughs> I actually had a question. Yeah. When you are studying these uh, discrete models, like the threshold, can you study them using symbolic dynamics or you lose too many information? Right. I have not tried to do that. Um, I think that one should be able to use, this is my intuition, that you should be able to use symbolic dynamics to help but I've never actually seen anybody do it. Okay. So that, that might be something to try. Is I, I don't, want, but, 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 you know, I was trained in dynamical systems and, and that does seem worth thinking about. Yeah, actually I'm a dynamicist. That's what I ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> so, I've, I've, I've never seen it, but I think, cause, okay. So the thing that I would actually try to do with that, and I, I, I don't really know how easy or hard it would be, but remember with the threshold models, I was mentioning that the mathematical theories are not good at distinguishing the different initial mm -hmm. conditions, that they do an yeah. average over initial conditions. Maybe if you did symbolic dynamics, that would be helpful towards figuring out and really codifying what different initial conditions do because the current, the current approaches, I mean, you can do it numerically, of course, but the current mathematical mm -hmm. approaches are not good at, at, at keeping track of that. So that's where I would look. Oh, okay. But I don't know how hard it is. Yeah, maybe we can try. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. I don't see any other questions, so let's thank Mason again. And with this talk, we actually finished the thematic session of modeling and dynamical systems. 
I thank you all for being here. And I invite you to continue in the other thematic sessions that are going on during this week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mason. Yeah, thank you very much.